Welcome to another episode of The Vast Majority. I am Jacobin Deputy Editor Micah Utrecht, joined by Megan Day, staff writer Jacobin, as well as Matt Chrisman of Chapo Trap House. Uh, hello to both of you. Hey. Hey, Micah. So, uh, this documentary, The Social Dilemma, uh, is out now, and uh, it's one of the most watched documentaries on Netflix and uh, is is a, a documentary that I think is a lot worth talking about it for, for, for numerous reasons. I mean, it is a, a, one of the most serious attempts to kind of reckon with uh, what what we have wrought with the proliferation of, uh, of social media in the 21st century. It seems like it's also probably an attempt to kind of... Uh, uh, it, it seems like the predecessor to some attempts to kind of regulate social media in a way that has not been done up until this point. And, and it is a real attempt to reckon with uh, how all of our brains are, are being rotted by uh, these mediums. Uh, so it, it seems to me like something that is, uh, that, that is very much worth uh, engaging with, if both because of what's actually in the documentary and, and maybe for the kind of society-wide conversation that they're clearly trying to spark with uh with this documentary uh and also because all of us uh uh, both the two of you for sure uh have have discussed you know just some of the most basic uh elements that are that are being highlighted in the movie about what is it what it is that social media is uh is is doing to us uh, as a as a society so this is not a sort of like uh, just open open dunk session on on a, a sh- yet another shitty uh, mainstream political cultural production. I mean, I think that there is a lot of really useful stuff to be taken out of this this documentary, but it kind of falls short in a couple places. So um, let's just start for for people who haven't seen it yet uh, a, a discussion of of what is in this documentary, maybe who is in this documentary, and why. Uh, why that uh, matters. Maybe, uh, Megan, can you just uh, start with a kind of a overview of those things? Yeah, this is a documentary that appears to be made by, I guess you would call them like Silicon Valley apostates. Like that's that those are the people who are featured in the documentary, people who have um, worked in Silicon Valley actually designing um, this persuasive technology to try to hook people on social media who have since realized that there are serious ethical problems with that and have renounced their former work. So the documentary is about a couple of different things at once. One of the things that it's about is how social media is intentionally hijacking the features of the human brain in order to keep people engaged for as long as possible so as to advertise them and so as to monetize their attention and how that has real implications for psychology and for health and happiness. And then the other thing that it's about is its effect on democracy. It's a fa- that's, the, that's the term that they use. It's effect on democracy or the fabric of democracy or the social fabric. It's effect on politics, essentially. I think it was a lot stronger in the, in the first arena. And obviously it will come as no surprise to anybody that I think it was weaker in the second arena because you know my standards are relatively high for this. I feel like it was missing a socialist analysis. I feel like it was drawing a false equivalence between what it termed the far left and the far right, even as it was gesturing toward the possibility that the real problem here was the profit motive. And the left is the only force in society that is sufficiently anti-capitalist. But it was still like the far left and the far right, extreme polarization, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's a quick overview of what it was about from my perspective. Matt, what do you make of the fact that the documentary is is made by these Silicon Valley types, gazing back in horror at the the Frankenstein's monster that they've uh, created? I mean, the the sort of normal flip answer would be to sort of like, well, these these people are the evil doers who brought us this situation. Why are we going to now turn to them? But there does seem to be a genuine horror by a number of these Silicon Valley types who uh, really are, are, are disturbed by what they've created and, and want to do something to change it. Uh, yeah, well, the first thing that I think of are all those politicians who, once they're out of office, decide that things like the war on drugs were a bad idea when they no longer have power. You know, And they serve a, a role in the system of by, by voicing dissent 
that they uh, ratify that this is some sort of deliberative process and that you know there are people involved in this and it isn't just a, an algorithm gone insane. No, there are real humans behind this and that they have souls They're, and that they, they get disturbed by this like you and they're horrified by it like you. Of course, not in time to stop anything ever from happening, but in time to get a TED Talk out of it or create some nonprofit panel out of it, maintain some role in the system as a gadfly that then is part of like a recuperated cultural conversation that doesn't change the actual uh, makeup of any of this stuff. But when you look at how hilariously uh, short-sighted this movie is in terms of its analysis of like what's actually causing this stuff and how honestly, like a lot of stuff about a lot a lot of the most alarmist stuff about silicon valley that comes from people who work there is very much i think wound up in this this god complex that these people have like they're essentially oh no the thing we built works too good oh geez look at us we done created a monster man i guess we're just too smart um one point that i do want to echo that matt made is that i think that they kind of implied that there was some a precise science behind this, but it's actually even scarier. Like what they were, the dystopian future that the movie was presenting to us was one in which these tech companies are able to actually like, um, like calibrate, perfectly triangulate and calibrate and extract money from every single moment that we're online. But I'm not entirely sure that that's true. I think they're trying to do that and they're building algorithms that suggest to investors and advertisers that they can do that. But in reality, they don't know what they're doing. They're unleashing like a genie from a bottle and it's not entirely clear precisely how that translates into profit and companies are just hoping that it does and they're buying the silicon valley uh, line that it does and they're throwing money into silicon valley in the hopes that it does so it's like even scarier in a way because it's actually not precise and it's not people sitting around smoking cigars and smoke-filled room and like planning out precisely how to puppet master us it's like they are puppet mastering us a little bit i mean a lot actually but they they don't entirely know to what end um even when it comes to profit so let's talk about uh the behavioral science stuff that's in the documentary because uh that stuff i found pretty compelling even if uh, even if we accept what, what you guys are saying uh about uh, sort of casting a, a wary eye on on these former silicon valley or current silicon valley just occupy a different part of silicon valley now uh these silicon valley uh types i mean there is uh an articulation of how uh, social media is uh, is uh, wrecking our brains in in a way that I think that is worth uh, discussing. Megan, do you want to go over some of that stuff that you found compelling? Yeah, I mean, this is where the documentary actually succeeds, uh, getting at what some of the ramifications of social media are for our psychology. And it's not like this is a totally revelatory or anything, but it is good to see it all in one place. I mean, I found it really compelling. Um, the idea that our brains, you know, evolved over millions of years, and they developed certain distinct features to help us do things like hunt and gather and live in society with each other and that those features are being hijacked um, and exploited multiple times a day. Like we're supposed to be able to, for example, respond to alerts. We're supposed to be able to recognize our own self in the form of our own name or our own picture. We're supposed to care about social dynamics and like worry about whether or not we are like well liked by people. These are their evolutionary purposes for all of these things. We're not supposed to do all of that stuff like 9,000 times a day. So our, our brains are being like genuinely abused by social media and they were very explicit about that and i thought they did a pretty good job explaining how that how that happens and the social effects of that you know increased alienation isolation um depression um a sense of you know like uh kind of like i self-esteem destroying perfectionism um they talked about how younger generations are actually more risk averse because they're they're more afraid of, you know, making a mistake. Um, and they sort of spend all of their time inside, basically on this journey on their phones, um, afraid to go outside. I don't know if that's like the total truth when it comes to young people, but we all know that there's a little bit of truth in that. And I find it very frightening. And personally, I've had the experience of having my, you know, evolutionary brain features be abused by social media. And it's extremely unpleasant. And it's very bad for your mental health. So I completely think that that's true. And I thought the documentary and I did a good job showing it. 
we weren't we weren't designed to live like this. We certainly weren't, and it's it's horrifying to think of how fast it has been normalized and assume that we should. From from the very beginning, literally the very first scenes of the movie, uh, the the documentary filmmakers ask a very uh, w- w- what should be a, a, a pretty obvious question, I think, of people who have decided that there is a problem with something that they created which is like what is the problem and there's this kind of funny scene i don't think the filmmakers did this purposefully but they're asking all of the all of their talking heads this question and nobody can quite answer it they're kind of like scratching their chins uh they've you know they're like oh well it's a little more complicated than that and uh watching that scene uh, for me i'm like the problem here is actually very simple it is that you all have created these platforms that are governed by the profit motive you're uh, you need to uh, accumulate more profits for your company you need to figure out more and better ways to do that and on your platforms the best way to do that is to get people on them for longer and so every decision that you make about what the platform looks like is is governed by that uh, and th- at the end, they, they, they say that, you know, it, this is a problem, but there's never any kind of like articulation of like, oh, maybe this is a, a bad way to like run social media platforms, communication platforms. Maybe it's also a bad way to, gov- uh, to, to have your society organized around this profit motive that clearly uh, is usually expressed in very antisocial ways when you sort of lean into, the, into that profit motive. The real missed opportunity for this movie is, is in that first half, they scratch towards something that I thought could have been very interesting. And frankly, I think would be the, the subject, the actual explicit text of a more interesting movie about this subject. And that is when they talk about AI, not as a external, like self-conscious uh, computer mind with its own will, but rather uh, the, the singularity being the moment when the technological uh like the the technological supremacy technological supremacy over human life and that technological supremacy being generated by an algorithm that is that has no human inputs for, into it, it, it that's just within the computer and that that algorithm is capitalism that algorithm is the profit motive like that's the program they put in there and then that will eventually take over all technology and all human behavior will be directed towards that goal, but not by human, not even at that point by human capitalists. It will be imposed on all by the uh, technological structures that are being, uh, that are moving with the logic of capitalism as their programming. Uh, and, that's 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 I think a a, a sobering uh, way and useful I think way to talk about the genuine like implications of the of the Silicon Valley uh, economy and its control over more and more parts of uh, human life and interaction. Uh, but they kind of they they kind of like gestured towards that before turning their mind back towards turning turning the focus uh, more onto this like depoliticized idea that well if we just get a different uh if we get a different programming in there it'll be okay which seems to me to be impossible like if the thing is it's only viable because it's maximally extractive then maximal extraction could be the only logic of it right and that is also a kind of obvious point to make in the face of uh, arguments about antitrust stuff for social media. Like that's kind of, I think it's briefly gestured to towards in the, in the documentary. It's certainly uh, something that is talked about a lot uh, with Silicon Valley right now, especially on the kind of liberal left. Um, But if, you know, you can break up Facebook, but if Facebook is still governed by this, profit motive it's you're just going to have a a couple smaller facebook's acting in exactly the same way i mean i genuinely think that you would because of the exponential growth of these platforms and the apparently limit limitless capacity for growth if you broke up facebook which i'm not against on principle i do think that you might just end up with several different facebook's that are each the size of facebook currently i mean i think that we're not grasping the really the real extent of the problem with that antitrust model which again like i said i'm not against on principle um i also want to say that i thought that 
the politics of the the movie are a little bit confused and also maybe some of the perspective of some of these people is a bit constrained you started to hear them some of them at the end were quoted talking about euphemistically about things like um the economic incentive that these companies have um uh the business model um you know like shareholder pressure i thought that these were you know like hinting at the idea that there's actually like the bigger problem is that we is that we live under capital I have no idea if any of these people would be able to or would want to articulate that themselves. I did think it left it open, though. There was actually one um, guy toward the end who I actually found, I have no idea what his name was or what company he worked at, but I, I found him like kind of charming for a Silicon Valley apostate who like runs one of these, like I don't know, ethical tech nonprofits. And he said something to the effect of, you know, just as in our economy, our economy being a euphemism, obviously, for capitalism, in our economy, just as a, a tree is worth more dead than alive, so too are, are our brains worth more endlessly scrolling than off, you know, living our lives in a rich way. And I thought, okay, well, maybe a person could watch this movie and actually come away with at least the beginning of an understanding that might dovetail with our politics. So I didn't think it foreclosed on it entirely. That said, it's a very confused movie because just minutes before you get the impression that one of the big problems with social media is that it's leading to extreme political polarization, which I don't totally disagree with. One thing that I do think is a problem is the erosion of a kind of shared a consensus reality, which makes political struggle extremely difficult. Yeah. And I agree with that, but they actually kind of missed the mark on that and implied that the, the rise of the extreme right and the extreme left were two symptoms of the same very bad phenomenon. Whereas what I would argue is that the rise of the extreme right is extremely concerning. And the rise of what they're calling the extreme left is actually one of the small upsides of this great clusterfuck, which is that we actually have had people who've been able to connect to different ideas um, on, through social media, including a lot of us, and develop, for example, socialist politics that are not, you know, that are at odds with what was previously the reality consensus, which was just basic liberalism. Well, and the implication of the movie is that there would not be political extremism and air quotes of any kind if it weren't for these tech companies distorted distorting our reality and pushing fake news and pushing uh you know more extreme content to its users uh you know that's the reason why there are all of these scary scenes of people in the streets protesting and the uh you know social media has uh has has destroyed what would have been the normal situation which was that we would all uh be chilling and uh, discoursing and uh and that everything would be calm be yeah. <laughs> yeah the erosion of the of the consensual reality as, as megan said is a huge accelerator of of like political extremism but it's not the engine. The engine is the fact that things keep getting fucking worse every fucking minute of every fucking day, <laughs> which is not mentioned at all in the film in any way. Like actual material conditions didn't have anything to do with any of the processes they're discussing. And that one manifestation of the quote unquote political extremism is actually just like it's the development, the, the beginning glimmers of the development of class consciousness in a highly class stratified and exploitative capitalist society. If what is being referred to as the extreme left was stronger earlier, then we wouldn't have had this problem if we accept the premise that the social that platform capitalism is owes in fact to the profit motive being completely unrestrained, right? Yeah, I mean, to me, the funniest sort of like plot line, you know, they they do this thing which is effective, uh, which is they have a kind of like two thirds documentary, one third sort of acting out, uh, you know, a, a, a feature film sort of interwoven throughout the movie is the kid who becomes radicalized by the uh, extreme center. I thought it was funny, by the way, that they mentioned the extreme center. The extreme center. <laughs> well, it's clearly an attempt to avoid yeah. accusations of partisanship, but yeah. they, they maybe they didn't read, uh, you know, Tarek Ali's book about the extreme center, you know, arguing about, uh, that the the, the, uh, the extreme center is its own kind of uh, ideological construct that has led us to this point. I also think that it it 
it kind of revealed the extent to which the people who made the documentary are in fact extremely in the center because to them they couldn't recognize that there is such a thing as the extreme center because they don't see it because it seems i suppose rational to them whereas if you're on the left for example if you're on the left and you're online you are very aware that there is such a thing as the extreme center the zenith of this uh young white kids radicalization through social media to the extreme center is uh that he he and his sister go you know end up at a protest and and it gets rowdy and they get arrested and the, the sort of implication is you see them both with like handcuffs on sitting on the ground is is like it's clearly a message to like white suburbia like do you want this to happen to your kids like you better act now or these kids are gonna do scary things like go to protests <laughs> I know. I thought that worst case scenario, your kid gets politicized, but it was completely vacant of political content. And I was just thinking like, well, it would be good if they were politicized in one way. It would be very bad if they were politicized in another way. But I think the film was both made by extreme centrist so to speak and then and then also that it was just really trying not to alienate anybody. I mean, on the one hand, these uh, these tech Folks, the, the the actual extreme centrists, uh, not the extreme center uh, uh, depicted in the movie, uh, but the 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 people who you know are, are wringing their hands in the movie about the lack of a shared narrative. I mean, it, I share that concern to uh, to some degree. On the other hand, we also know that when those people look at this this rendered garment of society and and the sort of like alternative facts or whatever they're they're not just talking about the like pizza gators and the bright barters of the world they're also talking about the chapo trap houses and the jacobin magazines of the world i mean uh they they see us as being a sort of um equally a part of that of that rending of the of the social fabric which is is funny because if you actually listen to what either of our respective uh, publications uh, outlets uh, argue i mean we're arguing for a, a restoration a rebuilding of the uh, the social fabric i mean that's very much at the center of the the socialist appeal and in the 21st century is to uh to rebuild uh a community if, if to the extent that it ever you know f- fully existed in the first place but to like to, to rebuild an actual society like not a neoliberalized atomized uh, society that that is is the ground upon which everything that's depicted in the movie as being negative can can flourish in i think that the the film suffers from like a horseshoe theory problem in a really extreme way and you know, my perspective on this is that the rise of conspiracy thinking on the right is actually really alarming. And I do think that it's true that uh, social media algorithms have facilitated that rise. I mean, it's it's hinted at in the movie, and it's also well documented elsewhere that, you know, Twitter and YouTube and Facebook algorithms have all not only amplified, uh, you know, what were previously fringe conspiracy theories like Pizzagate, but have actually also led to this new development in Um, the timeline of conspiracy thinking that we've never dealt with before, which is that because these algorithms have led conspiracy theorists to each other, they have also blended all conspiracy theories into one conspiracy theory for the first time in human history, and that is called QAnon. And it's extremely alarming, and it, it makes it very hard for us to do our version of responding to the chaos and instability of life under capitalism, which is to try to convince people to rationally and compassionately uh, take collective action for a more humane and sane society. Like that is what the that is what the left's project is, contra the project of QAnon, which is to basically incite chaotic civil war against various scapegoats and specters of instability. Um, So obviously, I think that we are the antidote to something like QAnon. And the film sees us and QAnon as being, you know, two manifestations of the same problem. Yeah, that that specific thing about how QAnon allows people to create a, a, a tapestry out of what previously had just been sort of isolated, irascible, like unconsidered uh, uh, nodes of of anger or fear or suspicion uh, because those things are the things that radicalization of one type or another are made out of. And Q is basically ensuring that for a, a growing number of people, they will all be subsumed uh, under a greater mantle of this, uh, this coherent uh, uh, at the level of like narrative, even if it's total nonsense at the level of fact uh, uh, story. 
that is very difficult to counteract with because it's it's being spread at places where people are spending all their time and which have replaced like reality to a large extent. The film manages to pull off something that's kind of incredible, which is discuss Pizzagate as an apolitical phenomenon. If you remember when they when they bring it up, there's a woman I, I forget who she is, but she is explaining it, and she's like. You know, I don't even know where to start. I mean, basically, it was it's just craziness, uh, and there's there's no and, and that that's happening throughout the movie. It's like uh, you know, genocide in in Myanmar against uh, Rohingya Muslims uh, that is that is you know spread uh, by uh, news being shared uh, on Facebook. I mean, PizzaGate. I mean, all, all these images across the screen, which are like right wing conspiracy theories, right wing violence, like far right violence uh and then at one point they said there's a there's a, a clip of a news anchor saying something like uh you know continued upheaval in italy and spain uh as if you know if, if you know anything about what's gone on in either of those two countries which i'm far from an expert but it's like in italy there the the the, the populist right is on the march and in Spain, there's some like pretty you know mild social democrats who have uh, made some made some gains. Um, but it all is just sort of like the same the same thing. Even though the images that are coming across the screen are very much uh, th- they are right wing. You know, they're images of the right being on the march and the right being the ones uh, who are doing these these the worst of these deeds that 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 is being depicted. And 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 then immediately after that, if you remember, there's like a scene where they're trying to show uh, this is what uh, you know, putting aside these this hyper partisan tribalization, uh, you know, what 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 a good politician who looks like who can sort of tamp down this this amped up rhetoric, and it's uh, Marco Rubio and and Jeff Flake like making the making the pitch to us to come together. Yeah, that was the thing when they put when they show. Just a just an absolute empty-headed uh, debate blurb from Rubio, like it means anything. It really makes you honestly a little terrified because, like, oh, these are supposed to, these are people who are actually close to, you know, the 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 node of this 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 pathology, and they think that fucking Marco Rubio. And his, we need to talk to one another. Shit is in any, it holds any water for anyone in any way. That's why I felt that the film was really politically incoherent, though, because that is, I, w- I almost wonder if people were responsible for different thirds of the film, because the the section that's about um, the dissolution of the political consensus is like so fundamentally conservative. And then immediately thereafter, we go to a kind of concluding section with the, you know, the Silicon Valley types who are at the heart of this movie. And, and there, a lot of them are talking about the problem. They're, they're actually hinting at the idea that the problem at the center of this is that these companies are in endless pursuit of profit. So it doesn't actually come together politically for me. Like, I'm not willing to say that this film is fundamentally an extreme center film. I think that there are moments in the film that are, and then there are moments in the film where you have like Jaron Lanier, who like, I don't really know what his deal is politically, but he seems to be indicating that unless we fundamentally transform our political and economic system, we're not going to get out of this mess. What's your guys' pitch if you, you the people who are in this movie who are these extreme centrists who treat the left and the right uh, as as essentially the same? I mean, what what would you say to them uh, to in sort of defense of of yourself as leftists who are who are involved in these new left media projects that are putting out a, a, a different you know a, a, a left narrative about. Uh, what's going on in the world like wh- how would you defend yourself uh against these people who who see you as sort of on par with the q types uh well it's tough i mean i honestly think for a lot of those people there's no it's not a good faith critique i mean they're saying it because it's a way to neutralize you because they have political objections to the project uh and i think that honestly goes for most of the people who would have like a, a sense of that because they're like the people in this movie they're relatively well off they don't they don't notice the material basis for a lot of the horrible things that they see sprouting out of social media they think that it's purely an imposition of this 
of this uh, bad industry on a country that like fundamentally what functions <laughs> uh and as a result, I don't think they have any interest in seeing a, a distinction drawn between uh, the left project and, and like populist paranoia on the right. Uh, so I think that the task is really more finding people uh, who aren't beholden to these narratives in the first place. And the good news is there actually are a ton of them. It's just it's almost impossible to conceive of that because of how we live in these epistemic tunnels. Uh, because online is where we relate to the world even more than the world around us. I would say all of that. And then I would add, as I often do, that the reason that people are attracted to conspiracy thinking on the right, for example, or even conspiracy thinking is a sort of extreme manifestation of it, but even just kind of like divisive scapegoating uh, on the right is that they do perceives that something real is is happening, which is that the world is falling apart. It's extremely difficult to live in the world. And so they're identifying a real problem, but they're unable to identify the real source of that instability. And, and there are all sorts of substitutions that various political actors are putting in front of them to see if they'll take up. And they will. They'll take them up unless they're provided with an alternative explanation for why the world is... Uh, you know, tearing apart at the seams or why it just feels so difficult to be alive sometimes. And, you know, this is sort of Marx and Engels' classic line that under capitalism, all that is solid melts into air. Capitalism means the constant remaking of the social world. For better and for worse, it can be liberatory, but for every step forward that we take, for every, you know, um, instance of liberation, there's also an imposition of a new type of unfreedom. And that's very crazy making. And people are looking for explanations for why things feel so chaotic. They want security and they want stability and they feel that it's elusive. And so they're searching for explanations and the right is offering them explanations in the form of it's immigrants or it's transgender people or it's black people. Or a step above that, it's, you know, it's Jews and it's a pedophile cabal and, and so on. Um, so our project is actually to provide people with an alternative explanation. The center wants to deny that that's even happening. Yeah. They're saying, actually, the world is not falling apart. Actually, if you think that the world is falling apart, then you're being susceptible to some kind of conspiracy thinking. What we're trying to do is acknowledge that people are right to perceive that life is chaotic and unstable because life under capitalism is chaotic and unstable by definition. And so we're offering, offering them an alternative explanation that actually promotes solidarity instead of division and that actually supplants that kind of scapegoating and conspiracy thinking. Our project is in diametric opposition to the project of QAnon, right? Like if we win an inch, that means they lose an inch. It's a, it's a game of tug of war. So that's what I would say in terms of defending ourselves to them, that actually we are we are the antidote to the problem on the other side of the spectrum. The uh, one thing that I kept thinking about throughout the entire movie especially the sections where the, the very effective sections where they're you know the the ai computer the guys running the ai are like trying to figure out how best to get this this kid to re-engage uh with his social media is that clearly the the uh, the collecting of that much data and this able to really micro target people's demographic profiles or moods or or what's going on in their life or whatever uh clearly all of this could be used for some serious social good i mean what what is depicted in the movie is that the 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 facebook algorithm is uh you know looking at for its the its individual user like when are they sad when are they depressed and then how do we get hook them into spending more time on the platform uh which in turn makes them more depressed and more sad and it becomes this like feedback loop but like clearly you could use that kind of data for socially beneficial purposes you could figure out when people are like depressed or having you know, suicidal feelings or something like that and then and then use that to uh, uh to try to offer an intervention and, and help for them or uh if somebody is like unable to uh make the rent or is is you know is experiencing food insecurity like you could use that data to try to provide them services uh it's just clear to me watching it that there there's we could do a lot with all of this data if if the profit motive were not governing uh the the functioning of, of companies like facebook if we could actually 
use all of this for socially beneficial purposes rather than purposes uh, that make the world more of a hellscape. I think I agree with you that it could, but I, I, my preference would be to simply leave it alone and not collect data about people's moods. But, you know, maybe the genie's <laughs> out of the bottle and, and we should be talking about how to use it for good instead of for ill. I will say that, I again, to go back to the portion of the film that I found the most effective, the sort of behavioral science stuff, um, certainly, it certainly resonated with my experience, the idea that the algorithm knows what kind of mood you respond to like what kind of mood you're in when you're doing your most sustained engagement and i think we all have we all have like a a, a mood preference right like some people like as as they say what do they call them like suburban facebook empathy moms their mood that keeps them hooked in is like pity or like uh thinking that things are cute right um we are all three of us are um political people. And I would wager to say that despite having relatively pleasant dispositions, probably the mood that keeps us hooked in the most is anger. Like yes. that's, that's the thing that keeps me looking at Twitter is I'm like, I can't believe that motherfucker said that. Who would say that? Why would anyone say that? Oh my God, people are agreeing <laughs> with this person. I cannot believe this. And that is what keeps me plugged in. And I assume that Twitter knows that about me. It can simply collect that data by, tr it's very simple to collect that data. It just knows which things I click on and which things I scroll down on to see like whole threads about. And now it knows, bam, it knows how to hook me in. So it's floating those things to the top of the algorithm, thus making me angrier as a person like that's really that's that's where it has like a real psychological effect on you as a person when i walk through the world i don't think of myself as an angry person twitter makes me an angrier person because it's constantly dosing me with anger because it knows that that's the emotion that keeps me engaged for the longest yeah no, there's no real redeeming that i, I don't really think uh, when, when 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 we know for a fact that only kind of negativity is is predictably uh, compelling i don't really know if there is a i mean there you can you can use that to your uh you can try to use that to your advantage like as an insurgent you know political movement uh which i think we all have to some degree or another uh but the idea that you can reshape from the top using uh, using tools that are this blunt and this frankly traumatic to the way that people uh uh, 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 like conceive of themselves and the world around them, I don't think it's possible. I think it has a really corrosive effect on our ability to organize as well. I mean, it's a, it's a really, it's a double-edged sword, which I think we all know very well. On the one hand, um, clearly all three of us are engaged in projects that require social media. Like we are trying to, again, we're trying to fight for the forces of light against the forces of darkness, the forces of reason against the forces of insanity. And we need social media in order to reach people. And we try to use it as effectively as we possibly can. At the same time, it's almost like one step forward, one step back, because you bring all of these people into your project, but the way that you're bringing them in is through this platform that they're already on. I mean, like they're already on it, right? We're not like making them be on Twitter, but like, or whatever, any other, any of the other platforms, but they are becoming poisoned by their sustained engagement. And actually it's poisoning the movement that you're trying to build as mm -hmm. well. So it, it does, it does feel like a bit of a trap. I mean, I've always said to Micah that, you know, unfortunately we can't log off. That's literally the title of an article that I wrote for Jacobin. Unfortunately, we can't log off. Because we have to be using these tools are already out there, these platform, the information is is already being, you know, pumped into these streams. It's just not our information. We have to counter, you know, we have to counter um, the bad, the bad information, the bad explanations for why the world is so shitty with our own explanations. We have to be in the mix. We have to be in there. But we have to also protect ourselves while we're doing that. Like me personally, I haven't been on Twitter for like three months that's very necessary cleansing for me after the primary, which was totally psychotic and insane and bad for my mental health. I think it's bad for most people's mental health to be on Twitter all the time. You should take breaks. And as I told Micah, even yesterday, we were just chatting about it. And I was like, you know, you should try to log off 
in your heart of hearts, even if you don't log off with your fingers. Yeah, like they're, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you, may, you, it may be possible that you can't actually stop using social media if you are pursuing a political project, but you should try as hard as you can to work on your own relationship with social media because you can get so easily consumed by this stuff. And it's just about the hardwiring of your brain. I mean, you, you are hardwired to care about the two words, your first and your last name. You're hardwired to care about those two things. Those things mean you. And when people are talking about you, you're hardwired to give a shit about that. And it's going to make you feel really good or really bad. Even when it makes you feel good, it makes you feel bad because you're you want more of that validation, right? You keep coming back and it's anx- it's anxious making. That stuff is terrible. That's really bad for our political project. It's bad for all the people who are actually responsible for carrying out our political project. So it's necessary for us to at the very least develop healthy healthy engagement techniques to the best of our ability. Yeah, we need yeah, the logging off in your heart thing is very important because if you are able to do that, if you're able to properly contextualize what you're seeing by like reinforcing, you know, your thoughts and, and, and not just sort of doing a Hail Mary and then going in every day and thinking that's going to do enough to distance you is that it really does make it less appealing too. if you're able to dull the intensity of the emotional response you're engaging with. It becomes boring and you you don't have to like limit your screen time necessarily because it's no longer a place where you're getting what you used to get out of it. And so you have to do something else because you'll just get too fucking antsy otherwise. Because it's it is boring. It's boring. Like the like the people on social media, like these are for the most part not talented individuals. You know, we're, we're none of us are particularly skilled entertainers. It's it's the, we go beyond entertainment into just these personal validation, uh, you know, battles, and that fills in the place of like an aesthetic appreciation you'd get from another you know entertainment form. And if that's drained of it, it's really just people having really banal arguments. And that's much easier to tune out. But the problem is you have to be able to really internalize that that red pill, that, that social media red pill, excusing the term. And how do you do it? I mean, do you have to – I mean, like, I, I feel like I've been on a personal journey of attempting to do it, to do it but I, I could never give anybody, like, lessons in it because it just feels like a really intensely yeah. personal – process you know it's, that's exactly that's the thing is it's very personal i've been banging the gong on this and in, in my streams for and, for and of course the irony there is oh you're on the internet telling people to get off the internet it's like yeah you got me uh but mostly i'm saying to people like i can't tell anyone to get offline it's right. absurd you know like it's a part of people in a way that they aren't even aware of uh but what i've been saying most of all is is to just think about like what what really what this really means what's really happening And specifically, just find a thing in your life that is actually satisfying in some way to do. And that combination of things will over time sort of centrifugally, I think, push you towards the more uh, productive stuff because you won't be able to get the same enjoyment out of being online. But you have to have an alternative, as I think a big thing. But as Megan said, it's a very uh, personal thing. Mike, have you logged off in your heart? Uh, Well... Does, I don't know if anyone ever, you know, it's not a decisive logging off in your heart. It's a process of continually logging off in your heart every day. Oh, no, yeah, you have to do it every day. <laughs> if, if you're on there every day, you have to, like, remind yourself. You have to be present in it or else you will get you will get ca- carried away by the current. But I think Matt's last point is very important. I mean, if, if you do log off in your heart, there is now more room in your heart for activities that will be better for your heart <laughs> absolutely so uh i guess we can end it there with the 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 admonition from uh, megan day and from all three of us uh you know log off in your heart indeed thanks guys thanks y'all bye